إن الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء وعلى آله وأصحابه ومن غله عما بعد قال جل وعلا تتجافى جنوبهم عن المضاجع يدعون ربهم قوفا وتمعا ومما رزقناهم ينفقون فلا تعلم نفس ما أخفي لهم من قرة عين جزاء بما كانوا يعملون My dear brothers and sisters I want to ask myself and you a basic fundamental question and the reason for asking you the question is not that you have to give me an answer but you have to give yourself an answer and you and I will have to give Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala an answer to this question and the question is very simple the question is do you believe Allah it's a very simple question do you believe Allah do you believe the messenger of Allah Muhammad Mustafa sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? Obviously, you ask this question to any Muslim, there's no Muslim who will say, I don't believe Allah. If he does not believe Allah, then he is not a Muslim. But the question is not a matter of simply asking a question and giving an answer. The question is inside the heart. Do I really believe Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Do I really believe Muhammad or Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa And that is the reason I began my khutbah with the ayah of Surah Sajda, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, تَتَجَافَ جُنُوبُهُمْ عَنِ الْمَضَاجِعِ يَدْعُونَ رَبَّهُمْ خَوْفًا وَتَمْعًا وَمِمَّا رَضَقْنَهُمْ يُنْفِقُونَ Allah says their sides forsake their beds. They get up in the middle of the night and they stand before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala بَيْنَ الْخَوْفِ وَتَمْعًا between fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and hope of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's mercy. The position of the Muslim is between these two points. The fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because of his awe, because of his majesty, because of his grace, because of his greatness, and because we believe that we have to one day stand before him and answer. And the other position is the position of hope from the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Bain al khawfi wa tamah. And Allah said, and they spend from what we have given them. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says the promise of Allah. فَلَا تَعْلَمُ نَفْسٌ مَا أُخْفِيَ لَهُمْ مِنْ قُرَّةِ عَيُنْ جَزَاءً بِمَا كَانُوا يَعْمَلُونَ Allah says that if they knew these people who stand in the night in this state between khawf and hope and ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they stand in the night and they speak to their Rabb. They stand in their night and they talk to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They tell Allah their story. And why does that seem strange to us today, Ajib? It does not seem strange to you if I tell you that I am telling my story to my friend here who, who I know. But it seems strange to us if I tell you that I am talking to God. That I am talking to Allah Jalla wa'ala. Because we have no concept, we have no connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Illa ma'ashallah, we have lost our connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So when somebody speaks in terms of connection to Allah, it seems strange to us. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned this. Allah said that if they knew what I have prepared for them as a reward for this action of theirs, then they would be delighted. It would be the coolness of their eyes. The promise of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Let us look at the promise of his Nabi Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said in a hadith narrated by Umm Habiba radiallahu anha, one of the mothers of the believers and she said and she narrated from Rasulullah and said that if any Muslim prays for the sake of Allah 12 raka'at every day over and above the fard if any Muslim prays 12 raka'at more than the fard on any day Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will build a house for him in Jannah Allah will build a palace in Jannah and then she adds and says, and these are her words. She says, after I heard Rasulullah saying this, I have never missed those 12 rakat. Now what are these 12 rakat? The two rakat of sunnah before fajr. 
the four rakat of sunnah before zuhr the two rakat of sunnah after maghrib and the two rakat of sunnah after isha yes two before fajr four before zuhr and two after zuhr I forgot the other two four before zuhr and two after zuhr so four and two six and two eight and then two after maghrib which is 10 and two after isha which is 12. So 12 rakat, the Prophet of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and we know that when Rasulullah sallallahu makes a promise, he is not making a promise on his own, he is making a promise because this is from the wahi ghair matlu, the wahi that is not recited, which was sent to him by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So when Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa said, Allah will make a palace in Jannah, he is not speaking on his own behalf, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told him that he makes a palace in Jannah. Now, question is this. For most of us here, neither this ayah of Surah Sajda nor this hadith is strange. For most of us here, we have heard both this ayah and this hadith many times. The question is, and that's why I said, let us ask ourselves, do I really believe Allah? Do I really believe Rasulullah How real is Jannah to me? How real is that palace in Jannah to me? Because why am I asking that? Because it is natural logic and sensible thing that the person who believes in a return on investment invests in that thing which gives him that great return. Yes? If I tell you that I am going to give you some insider information about an IPO that is coming and this company they are going to float shares and that IPO is going to go, it's going to get oversubscribed and you are going to get 1 to 10,000 or 1 to 1,000 or 1 to 100 whatever return, then what will you do? If you believe that information, I mean, you might say, well, you know what, this guy talks, I mean, you know, we, uh, we don't know, maybe this is all, maybe it's all bunkum and I put my money and I get nothing. But if you are not that, if you say, no, 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 this guy, he is one of the biggest brokers on the stock exchange. I mean, if he is, says something like his word is absolutely sure, you know, and he's my dear friend and he's not broadcasting this information everywhere. And when the man is saying this, he's also saying, and you can see from his own balance sheet that he has invested himself. Yes? And that's an important point, yes? If I'm asking you, invest in something, what will you ask me? You say, well, how much have you put in there? And I tell you, I have put in every cent that I have got and I can prove it to you. Then do you believe me or not? You believe me. And then what do you do? If you believe me in this, in this particular case where you know you are going to get this great return on this investment and you believe me, what do you do? You invest. You invest. You say, alright, here is a man who is speaking the truth. He is promising me a great return on my investment. He himself has invested. Now what? Now one of two things. Either I still don't believe him and I say, sorry, I'm sorry, I don't believe you. Either you are a liar or maybe you are just, you're not a liar, you're you speaking the truth, but your judgment is wrong. I'm sorry, I don't trust your judgment. That can be the, that can also be the case. I mean, you're not lying, but maybe you're mistaken, right? Maybe your judgment is wrong. So, sorry, you may have invested, but I'm not investing. Or you say, no, no, no. I believe you and I believe your judgment and I believe you are right and you have invested. I have faith in you and therefore I will also invest. One of two situations, you can't have, there's no third situation in this case. Therefore, the question I ask myself and I ask you is this. Do we believe Allah? Because if we believe Allah, then what am I doing sleeping at that part of the night? What am I doing sleeping at that part of the night? A one who believes in this ayah of Surah Al-Sajda, how is it that he does not pray tahajjud? The one who believes in this hadith of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam with respect to the fadail of the, the sunnah after the fard salawat, how is it that this person, the minute he makes salam after fard, he walks? Let us give them the best of doubt and say maybe he is going to pray sunnah in his house. If he is doing that, alhamdulillah, there is no problem. There is no compulsion that you have to pray sunnah in the masjid. As a matter of fact, it is better to pray sunnah in the house. But what if the person is not praying sunnah at all? Then what does it say about his faith in the word of Muhammad Rasulullah <clears throat> Just as an example I gave you two, one hadith and one ayah. But obviously this applies to all the promises of Allah and all the promises of Rasulullah And therefore I say today, the topic of this khutbah is 
how real is Jannah? How real is Jannah? In our LEC, in the Leadership Excellence course, we asked people to do an exercise. We said, make a balance sheet. Make a balance sheet. On the left side, you put left behind. Make a column saying left behind. What are the things I am leaving behind? My material possessions and so on and so forth. And on the right column, you put sent ahead. Sent ahead. And why is this balance sheet important? I recommend to you, make this balance sheet. And keep updating this balance sheet on a daily basis. And you know why this balance sheet is important? Because what you leave behind, you will be questioned about. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will take his up. And what you send ahead, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give you reward. Insha'Allah, what you send ahead is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give you and show you the account of this. This is what you sent and this is what I'm giving you. And what you leave behind is something that we will have to answer to Allah for. And if what we leave behind is entirely halal, then if Allah takes his up, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa said, the one for whom Allah takes his up is destroyed. It's only the mercy of Allah that will take us out of that. But what if there is, in what we leave behind, if there is also some mixture of what is haram? Then what? Make a balance sheet. Now, having said this, let us look at those people who believed in this Jannah. Who believed the word of Muhammad Rasulullah Who believed the promises of Allah. What was their life like? What did they do? <clears throat> The famous uh, saying of Ali bin Abi Talib, he said that if Jannah and Jahannam are brought before me and put in front of me, my iman in either will not change by an iota. He said, I already believe in Jannah and Jahannam to the extent where there cannot be any change, even if I see it. Now, what is this, what is this level of yaqeen that he is talking about? And as I told you, the Sahaba of Rasulullah are the gold standard. They are the ones against whom everyone else will be measured. Not against anyone else, against the Sahaba of Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And therefore, what will we do on the day when the curtain is lifted and we are faced with reality and we lived in denial all our lives? The pain of regret is the worst of all pains. And therefore, let us not fall into that pain. The pain of regret. So let us see examples of people who believed. Who believed Allah and who believed his messenger Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Ka'ab bin Malik radiallahu anhu. He was one of those people who also recorded the revelation. The wahi. And Ka'ab bin Malik radiallahu anhu narrates. He said we left for hajj with the agreement that we would meet at Al-Aqaba in the Ayyam tashriq They left Medina to come for Hajj. And he said that we had an agreement with Rasulullah to meet him in a place called Al-Aqaba in the days when you are in, in Mina, in the Ayyam tashriq And he said, we kept this a, sec a secret and none of the non-Muslims in our group knew about this except a man called Abu Jabr. And Abu Jabr was the only non-Muslim from Medina who came with this group of Sahaba. There were about 70 of them. And they, he, Abu Jabr was the only one who uh, was not a Muslim and he was with this group. So they all said to Abu Jabr, they said, look, give up these ways of yours, otherwise you will become the fuel of the hellfire. So Abu Jabr accepted Islam. So then there, was, there were no non-Muslims among them. They had all accepted Islam. He said, we came in ones and twos. And when we had all gathered, Al-Abbas bin Abdul Muttalib came with Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa And he said, first, Al-Abbas bin Abdul Muttalib, <coughs> who at that time was not a Muslim, Allah alam, he said he spoke. And Al-Abbas was the man who gave protection from the Banu Hashim to Rasulullah sallallahu after the passing away of his brother Abu Talib. So Al-Abbas said, 
You know the position Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam has with us. He has our protection and is safe in his town. He now wants to join you and you have invited him. If you are sincere in your promise to protect him and support him, then it is up to you to stand by your promise. If you intend to abandon him and give him up to his enemies, then leave now. So leave him with us. Now when Abbas bin Abdul Muttalib finished speaking, the leader of the Ansar stood up and he said, we have heard what Al-Abbas said. O Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa please speak to us. Ask us what you want from us and take whatever you want from us for yourself and your Rabb. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa stood up and said, and listen to this, this speech of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa Just see what he is asking. Just ask yourself, is it even reasonable for someone to ask this? In my view, this is one of the many proofs of the divine message of Rasulullah sallallahu Because no one can logically ask something like this. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa said, I ask you to pledge that you will defend me like you defend your own women and children. That if necessary, you will give up your lives to defend me. And you must pledge to hear and obey me in times of action and no action. Which means that you will hear and obey me whether you like what I say or not. Whether you even understand the reason why I am saying something or not. Complete, implicit obedience without question. And then he said, <clears throat> and you must pledge that you will give. When I ask you to give for the sake of Islam, he said, I want you to pledge that you will give when you have it and when you don't have it. In times of ease and in times of hardship. And you will advocate good and forbid evil. And you will speak out for Allah and not fear any blame for speaking for Allah. You must help and defend me if I come to you in the same way as you help and defend your wives and children. As I said, just think about this. <clears throat> they are inviting him to Medina to come there. <clears throat> they are asking him, what can we do for you? <clears throat> what do you expect from us? And in short, he's saying, that I expect you to sacrifice your life, your wealth, and your reason for me, simply if I ask, without a question, and without any resistance whatsoever. Does this even sound reasonable to you? Seriously, think about this. Does this even sound reasonable to you? <clears throat> you know what the Ansar said? Kabin Malik of Dalanu said, our leader said, Al Bara bin Maruf, he stood up and said, Ya Rasulullah, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said, Tell us what will we get in return. He said, Tell us what will we get in return. And Kabin Malik of Dalanu said, Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam answered with one word. He said, Jannah. He said, Jannah. And that is not the bottom line of the story. You know the bottom line of the story? Is what the Ansar said in return. He said, spontaneously they said, what a bargain. They said, what a brilliant deal this is. They said, what a bargain. What a bargain. Ajib, eh? Here is a man asking you to sacrifice your life and your wealth and your reason, and your izza, and everything you have in this world, concrete stuff in your hands, and he's promising you a pie in the sky, and you say, what a bargain. What a bargain. What does it tell you? It tells you that for them, that was not a pie in the sky. That thing was more real than what they have here. That was more real. That is the reality. Innam al-hayatul dunya, illa matawal ghurur. Except that we are stuck we are not watching a movie, we are in that screen. 
So why for us that is reality, whereas you know and I know that is not reality. They said, what a bargain. Story number two. Suhaib al-Rumi, radiallahu anhu. He was called a Rumi because he had been taken as a prisoner when he was barely five years old. He was the son of an Arab governor of Al-Uballa on behalf of the Persian king, a man called Sinan ibn Malik. And Suhaib ibn Malik, Suhaib, not Suhaib Malik, Suhaib ibn Sinan was five years old. His mother took him for a picnic to a city called Athani. And the Romans attacked that city, the Byzantine Empire, and they took a lot of women and children as prisoners. And Suhaib, who was five years old, was taken as a prisoner, and he was taken away from there. Now he uh, grew up among the Byzantines, among the uh, in the Byzantine Empire, among the Romans, and he passed from one master to another. He was sold many times. And the, he learned the language of the Romans, which was Greek. Latin even then was a dead language. The language of speaking and so on and so forth was Greek. So Suhaib al-Rumi used to speak Greek. And he practically forgot Arabic. And when he finally came to live in Mecca, uh, he almost relearned his own language. And he used to speak Arabic with an accent. And the Arabs are very particular about, about accents and so on and so on. So they used to call him Rumi. They say, he's a Roman. Because his Arabic is not clean. It's not clear. You know, his accent, he's got all sorts of accents. <coughs> like for us Indians, for example. You know, all of us pray, when we say Surat Al-Fatiha, we say, غَيْرِ الْمَغْزُوبِ عَلَيْهِمْ وَلَا zalin. And all the Arabs laugh. Say, Who is Zalin is this? Huh? What happened to the Da? <laughs> yes? So in, in uh, not only Tajweed of Quran, but when you're speaking Arabic, especially Fusha, the language is very important to pronounce things correctly. And of course, as we know, in some cases, the meaning itself changes. And in some cases, your entire salah might be invalid, might, be, might get invalidated because of what you, of how you said whatever you said. So Suhaib al-Rumi, he came and then he escaped from the, uh, from the Byzantines. And finally, he uh, was brought to Mecca and uh, came and he became uh, a representative of a man called Abdullah ibn Judan who was an aristocrat, he was a very wealthy man in Makkah. Now, Abdullah ibn Judan had a lot of money and Suhaib al-Rumi told him that, he said, look, uh, if you give me some of your money, I'll invest it for you and uh, we have a partnership deal and, you know, the profit we make, I give you a share, I also keep a share. And Abdullah ibn Judan said, this is good, you know, let him do the work and I get the benefit. And this continued and in the process, Suhaib al-Rumi, anhu, became very wealthy because he was getting his commission out of the street and became very wealthy. Now this whole story is about 20 years before Rasulullah proclaimed Islam. So when Nabi proclaimed Islam, Suhaib al-Rumi was one of the people who heard about it. And he said, let me go and listen to what he has to say. He went to Baytul Arqam and he heard Nabi wasallam presenting Islam and it made sense to him and he accepted Islam. Now the Quraysh uh, learned about this. And they started tormenting him. But because he was not a slave, he was a wealthy man. They couldn't uh, physically do things to him. But they tried to make life difficult for him. Rasulullah then permitted migration to Medina. And he himself left and went to Medina. Now, Suhaib al-Rumi whose intention was to actually migrate with Rasulullah and Abu Bakr al-Siddiq when they were going. But the Makkans knew or they realized that something is going on. So they actually put guards on his house. So he could not go when Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was leaving. So Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam left and Suhaib Rumi was stuck in Medina, in, in Makkah. Now he kept on trying to leave and he could not leave. The guards were on his door. So one night he claimed that he had an upset stomach. So he went out of his house several times in the night as if he was going to the toilet. And the guards thought that, you know, well, you know, he must be really sick or something. But he had previously made arrangements for a transport for a horse and so on. So on one of these uh, trips out of the house, he went and found his mount and he took off for Medina. 
Now the guards realized that he has escaped, so they started chasing him. And eventually, later on in the day, they caught up with him. Now when they caught up with him, he climbed onto a mountain. There was a, there was a hillock. He climbed on top of the hillock. And they surrounded the hillock and they were coming up to get him. So Swayva Rumi was behind a rock and he said to them, he said, look, you know that I am the best archer amongst you. He said, you know this, that I am a best archer amongst you. So if you come after me, then I will pick you off one by one. And then when my arrows are over, if there is still somebody left, he said, I will come for him with my sword. And then we will see what has to happen will happen. So they stopped because they knew that, you know, you're, you're talking to a man who, who could deliver what he was saying. So Suhaib or Rumi then said to them, he said, look, I know what you are after. You really want my money. So why don't we do a deal? And my deal is that I'll tell you where my money is. That you will get my money and leave me alone. And see the beauty of the Muslim. The Quraysh, these enemies, they agreed. They did not say, we leave two guards here to see whether you are speaking the truth or not. We go and find the money. If you find the money, then we leave you. No. He simply said, I will tell you where the money is. And they said, okay, we leave you. Why? Because they know that a Muslim does not lie. The enemies knew this. The enemies knew this, that a Muslim does not lie. I've mentioned this before in a khutbah, that in South Africa, in the apartheid days, by law, a Muslim did not need to pledge an oath in court that he will speak the truth. He did not need to swear on the Bible or anything. That I swear that I will speak the truth and nothing but the truth. No, the Muslim did not need to do that. Why? By law, legally. A Muslim in South Africa and the apartheid days did not need to pledge to speak the truth. Why? Because people said Muslims always speak the truth. Who are saying this? The non-Muslims. It's a, it's a non-Muslim country. It's a Christian country. And they, they require Christians to swear an oath on the Bible. Their own people. They require the Christians to, swore, to swear an oath on the Bible to speak the truth. But in a Christian country, the Muslims did not need to swear an oath on the Quran or anything. Because they say we don't, they, don't, they don't need to swear an oath because Muslims speak the truth. Sadly, no longer the case. So Suhaib or Rumi says to them, I will tell you where the money is. You go get it, leave me alone. They said, okay, deal is done. They left him. They went off to get the money. Suhaib or Rumi eventually reached Quba, where Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was, was, uh, was camped. And the moment Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam saw him, he said, oh Suhaib, what a bargain. He said, what a brilliant deal you did. He said, what a bargain. And Suhaib or Rumi said, Ya Rasulullah, only Allah could have told you this. Because there is no one who knows this. There is no one who knows what I did except those people and me. And those people went to Makkah. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent Jibreel alayhi salam to tell Nabi sallallahu alayhi salam what was happening. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed Quran on this particular matter. In Surah Al-Baqarah, ayah number 207, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, وَمِنَ النَّاسِ مَنْ يَشْرِي نَفْسَهُ Ibutigha Mardatilla Wallahu Raufum Bil Ibad. Allah said, and of mankind among the people is he who, who would sell himself seeking the pleasure of Allah. Swell, Swayba Rumi sold himself. Allah said, Among the people is the one who sells himself for the sake of Allah. And Allah is Raufum Bil Ibad. Allah is full of kindness for his slaves. Allah revealed the Quran on this. For whom? For the one who believed in the promise of Allah. The one who, who gave away his entire life's collection. Think about this. I always tell people when we listen to this waqiyat, this is not entertainment. This is not passing of the time. Put yourself in that place. Think about your houses. Think about your properties. Think about your money. Think about everything, your jewelry, and so on and so on. And say, what would it be if I gave everything away? All my clothes, all my shoes, all my handbags, <clears throat> all my briefcases, all my pens, all my goggles, all my cars, all my land, everything, 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 every single thing, except the clothes on my body. If I give everything away for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, 
that Allah will give me Jannah. Then you would be doing what Suhaib al-Rumi did. We're not talking about giving some money or giving some wealth. We are talking about everything. Allah ke waste kangal ho jana bolte nahi. Vaisaya khisa. Literally. Completely everything. You own nothing except the shirt on your back. That is what he did. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed the Quran. I am not saying you should do this. By all means keep. Live well. Eat halal. Live halal. But also don't accumulate and accumulate and accumulate. Also think of accumulating in the Akhirah. And you will only accumulate in the Akhirah and I will only accumulate in the Akhirah if we actually believe that Akhirah is true. If someone tells you give money for the sake of Allah and you say no, no, I have to make first of all two rakat istikhara to see whether I should give money in the path of Allah or not. Eh? That shows your understanding of deen. You want to make istikhara before you give khairat. La hawla la quwwata illa billah. Make tawbah. Make the two rakat, not of istikhara, of tawbah. Suhaib or Rumi. Then we go to another one. Rasulullah sallallahu is in Medina. <coughs> and a young orphan comes to him. A, li- a young boy comes to him as an orphan. And he comes to him and tells him a story. And the story of this boy was that this boy had a small... Uh, a small... Uh, dead palm garden and he had a little house there and he was trying to build a wall he was getting a wall constructed around that to secure that property and it so happened that there was a man who had a big dead palm garden next to his a man whose name was Abu Lubaba so Abu Lubaba is a Muslim also there was one tree of Abu Lubaba's garden which came in the way of this wall so this boy went to Abu Lubaba who was his neighbor and he said, please, can you allow me, can you give me this tree? So I will cut the tree and uh, I will make my wall, or I will go around the tree or something. So because this is your property. <coughs> Abu Lubaba said no. So he said, all right, so you, want, you don't want to give me the tree? Sell me the tree. Whatever the value of the tree, I will pay you for that and I will build my wall. Abu Lubaba said no. I will not give it to you and I will not sell it to you. So now this poor boy, he's got no one. So he went to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa And he complained. So Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, very softly, he said, where is Abu Lubaba? So they called him. And when he came, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa said to him, give him that tree. You got a big garden, so many trees, hundreds of trees, give him one tree. So Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa said, give him that tree. Abu Lubaba said, no. He said, it is my haq. I will not give it. Rasulullah said, all right, so sell him the tree. <coughs> sell him the tree. Abu Lubaba said, no, I will not sell it to him. Then Rasulullah said, look, do this. Sell me that tree. Sell me that tree. He said, give me one branch of this tree. And I will guarantee you a tree in Jannah. I am talking about the guarantee of Rasulullah wasallam. He said, sell me the tree and I will give you a tree in Jannah. Abu Lubaba said, I don't want it and he walked away. He said, I don't want it. He went away. Now there was a sahabi, Radiallahu, who was sitting there and his name is Abu Dahda. Not Abu Darda, who is also a sahabi. This is Abu Dahda. Abu Dahda was known for the fact that he had one of the most profitable, one of the best Date palm gardens in Medina. He had a huge garden which had 600 trees in it. He had a house in it. He used to live there with his family. And in this, in this garden was a source, perennial source of sweet water. It was a very beautiful garden. So Abu Dada radiallahu anhu was there. He heard this whole conversation. He went to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He said, Ya Rasulullah, if I buy this tree for you, will you give me the same deal which you promised this man? Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, yes. So Abu Dada ran behind Abu Lubaba. And he said, yeah, Abu Lubaba. He said, do you know me? He said, yes. He said, what do you know about me? He said, you are Abu Dada and you have this fantastic date palm garden. 
<clears throat> so Abu Dada said, look, I have come to you to ask you for a favor. What's the favor? The favor is sell me that one tree. So Abu Baba said, I didn't sell it to the Prophet of Allah. Why will I sell it to you? Eh? He said, I did not even sell it to Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Why will I sell it to you? So Abu Dada said, no, no, no. Listen to my whole deal. Let me first tell you what the deal is. He said, the deal is that I give you my garden with the house, with the well, with everything for that one tree. <clears throat> so Abu Rubaba turned around and looked at him. He said, are you crazy? He said, are you out of your mind? You're mad or what? You know, people gathered. He said, are you mad? Are you crazy? He said, I'm not crazy. He said, you are telling me that you will give me 600 date palms with the house and with the well and with everything for that one tree which I have. Abu Dada said, yes, that is what I am telling you. So Abu Lubaba said, if that is what you are telling me, then I, am, I accept it. Give it. <clears throat> Abu Lubaba said, oh people, you are witness, this deal is done. Right? Then he went to his garden. And listen people, listen carefully. <clears throat> These Sahaba are hujjah. They are the proof. They are the standard. Abu Dahda radiallahu goes to his, to his garden. He stands outside the gate and he calls out and he says, Ya Umm Dahda, he's calling, he's calling his wife. He says, Ya Umm Dahda, come. Leave the house, bring the children. Come out. She said, where are we going? He said, we are going away from here. He said, why? He said, because I just sold all of this for Allah and his messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And you know what she says? She says, what a bargain. She says, what a bargain. Hey? Hajib. I mean, these people were seeing pictures which we don't see anymore, yeah? They had some reality before their eyes, which we don't have anymore. Here is this woman who just lost her house, who just lost her property, who just lost everything she had, and she says, subhanallah, what a bargain. She doesn't tell her husband, you're crazy, man. What are you talking about? You're giving away all this? She says, what a bargain. And that is not even the end of the story. You know what the end of the story is? As she is coming out of the, out of the garden with her children, the little ones have some dates in their hands. They're living in the middle of a, grave, of a dead garden. What do you think they have in their hands? They had some dates in their hands. Umm Dada holds the hands, opens the hand, takes out the dates, Throws them back in the garden. Says, that is for Allah. Come. We don't even take one date from that garden. After your father sold it. He says that is for Allah. Come out. Ajib. Abu Dada then goes to Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And he says. Ya Rasulullah. Tell the boy. That tree is his. I just bought it. And he says. Ya Rasulullah. Tell me. Do I have my tree in Jannah? Do I have my tree in Jannah? And Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa says to him, Abu Dada, when I promised you that tree in Jannah, Allah showed me your Jannah and it had one tree. And he said, now Allah showed me your Jannah. And your tree, your Jannah is filled with dead pumps. Filled with dead pumps. Reality, my brothers and sisters, <coughs> Reality is that which does not depend on belief. Reality is that which we invest in. My last story for today. Today is storytelling day. Eh? <clears throat> A man by the name of Saad al-Sulaymi, African man, black, very dark complexion, not nice to look at. There are people who have dark complexion who are brilliantly handsome. He, he was not. He was not. He had a dark complexion and he was not, not good looking. He came to Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and he said, Ya Rasulullah, can somebody with my color enter Jannah? Eh? Remember, they are living in a racist society. Just like our society. Very racist. Color is everything. <clears throat> they even have language which is upside down. हमारे बेटों के वास्ते दुलाना ढूंढने जाते हां अब बोलते हो बच्ची को नहीं जरा रंग कम है रंग कम नहीं है रंग तो ज्यादा है 
کم رہا تو چٹی رہتی تھی سوفی چدر کی ویسی نہیں زیادہ ہے بول کے آپ کو پسند نہیں آ رہی آئی نو آل مائی عرب اینڈ سوڈانی اینڈ سو آن سو آن دے ڈونٹ انڈرسٹینڈ دس لینگویج آئی ایم ٹرائنگ ٹو سیو مائی سیلف سم شیم اٹ از اوکے دیٹ یو ڈونٹ انڈرسٹینڈ اٹ دس آئی وونٹ ٹرانسلیٹ لا حول قوة الا وی آر ریسسٹ وی آر ریسسٹ ہیو فیئر اللہ شیطان واز لیس واز ریسسٹ ابلیس واز دا فرسٹ ریسسٹ یو نو وائی ہی سیڈ خلقتنی من نار و خلقتہ من تین ہی سیڈ مائی ریس از سپیریئر ٹو ہز آئی ایم کریٹڈ فرام فائر ہی از کریٹڈ فرام سوئل فرام مڈ اینڈ اللہ سبحانہ و تعالی سیڈ اور یو ور کریٹڈ فرام فائر دیٹس وائی یو ول بی ان دا فائر تو سعد سلیم رضی اللہ عنہ گوس نبی صلی اللہ علیہ وسلم ہی سیڈ یا رسول اللہ Someone with my color, can he enter Jannah? Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Anyone who said, Ashadu an la ilaha illallah, wa ashadu anna muhammad wa rasulullah, will enter Jannah. Color and race and nasab and hasab and nationality and whatever has no meaning in Islam whatsoever. So Sa'ad al Sulaim said, Ashadu an la ilaha illallah, wa ashadu anna ka rasulullah. I bear witness that there is no one worthy of worship except Allah. And I bear witness that you are his messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And then Sayyid al-Sulaymi says to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, Ya Rasulullah, for eight months I have been trying to get married, but no one wants to give their daughter to me because of my color. So please help me. So Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says to him, do you know a man called Amr ibn al-Wahab? So Sayyid al-Sulaymi said, no, I don't know Amr ibn al-Wahab. He said, go and find out where is the house of Amr ibn al-Wahab. And he said, go and tell him that I sent you to ask for the hand of his daughter in marriage. Now, Amar bin Wahab had a daughter who was, she was like a legend in Medina. She was so beautiful that she was the most beautiful woman in Medina. And Rasulullah sends this man to get married to her. So Sa'ad al-Sulaymi goes there, knocks on the door, Amr bin Wahab opens the door, he says, Sa'ad al-Sulaymi says, the messenger of Allah has sent me. And Sa'ad al-Sulaymi, and, and Amr bin Wahab is very happy, he says, MashaAllah, you are a guest of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, please come in. And, and Sa'ad al-Sulaymi, you know, he knows life. So he says, no, before I come in, let me tell you why he sent me. He says, why did he send you? He said, he sent me to ask for the hand of your daughter in, in marriage. And Amr ibn al-Wahib said, you are lying. He said, you're not, you're not speaking the truth. So Sa'ad al-Sulaymi, he heard this. Obviously, he was upset. <coughs> he turned around and he went back to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa Now this conversation, the girl who Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sent him to marry, she was in the room inside and she heard this conversation. And she called her father, she said, what have you done? He said, do you realize what you have done? You have refused an order of Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He said, go, run behind that man. Don't let that man reach Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam before you. He said, go and run behind that man and tell Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that you have accepted his proposal of marriage. I am willing to marry him. So give me to him in marriage. So Amar bin Wahab who had recently accepted Islam at that time, he ran. By then, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa had, uh, Saad al-Sulaymi had already reached and told his story. So when Amar bin Wahab reached there, <coughs> Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa said to him, is this the man who rejected the command of the messenger of Allah? And Amar bin Wahab said, Ya Rasulullah, I apologize, I am very sorry. I did not realize, I thought the man was lying, that's why I told him I was not, I was not rejecting your command. But now that I know that he came from you, I have come to say that I am very happy to give my daughter in marriage to him. So Rasulullah then said to Saad al-Sulaymi, he said, alright, so now you have a wife, what will you give as mahar? Because to get married you have to give mahar. He said, what will you give as mahar? So Saad al-Sulaymi said, Ya Rasulullah, I have no money. I have nothing. So Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa smiled and he said, go to Abdurrahman ibn Auf and go to Ali ibn Abi Talib and go to Uthman ibn Affan and tell them that I sent you. So he first went to Abdurrahman ibn Auf. He gave him several hundred dirham. 
Then he went to Uthman ibn Affan and he asked him, how much did Abdul Rahman give you? He said, so much. He gave him more. And then he went to Ali bin Abi Talib and he said, what did they give you? He said, so much. He gave him more than all of that. So now Sa'ad al-Sulaymi is loaded. Right? He is loaded. So he goes into the market of Medina to buy armor and to buy, not armor, he goes to buy presents. I mean, he's for his mahar, so he's, you know, to give the mahar to his wife and to buy presents for the family and so on and so on. And in the bazaar of Medina, he hears the call. Ya khayalullah, irkabi, O horseman of Allah, mount up, which was the adhan of jihad. So Saad al-Sulaymi radiallahu smiles. He looks up at the sky and he said, Oh Allah, I choose you. He said, Oh Allah, I choose you. And then with that money, instead of buying gifts, he buys a horse, he buys armor, he buys a shield, he buys weapons. And he puts on his armor and covers himself completely so that nothing is visible except his two eyes. Why did he do that? Because he knew that if Rasulullah saw him, he will not let him participate in the jihad. He would have sent him back. He said, you are supposed to get married, go get married. So he hid himself from Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And when he joined the troops, Ali bin Abi Talib who was the quartermaster general. He was the one who was gathering the troops. So people asked, who is this warrior? We, we don't know who the man is. Ali bin Abi Talib said, leave him alone. He has come to fight with us, let him fight. The battle started, they went out in the battle, the battle started. This warrior who nobody knows is in the thick of it. He is fighting, cutting left and right and he is in the middle of the enemy. And after many hours his horse gets tired. So the man dismounts. And when he dismounts he puts, pulls up his sleeves and people see the black arm. And Ali bin Abi Talib, he saw him, he said, Saad, is that you? And Saad said, yes, this is me. And then he mounts up again and he goes back into the battle and he's fighting and he's fighting and suddenly there is a call, there is a call, there is a shout and they say, Saad has been shaheed. He said, Saad has been killed. He has been martyred. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam rushed into the battlefield. He rushed into the battlefield. He went to the body of Saad as-Sulaymi radiallahu He sat down. He put his head on his lap. He opened the armor. He cleaned his face with a cloth and he wept and the blessed tears of Muhammad Rasulullah fell on the face of Sa'ad as-Sulaymi radiallahu And then Rasulullah looked up at the sky and when he looked up at the sky Rasulullah smiled and then he looked away. He smiled and he looked away. And one of the Sahaba who was there he asked him, he said, Ya Rasulullah we saw you doing something strange. We saw you looking up at you. We saw you first of all crying. And then we saw you looking up at the sky and then you looked away. What was this about? Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, I cried because I missed my companion. I cried because my Saad died. But he said, when I looked up at the sky, Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala showed me Saad. Saad was on the edge of a clear lake in Jannah. And he said, the, the border of the lake the beach of the lake is made of diamonds and precious stones. And he said, I saw the wives of Saad coming running to him. And he said, the, the speed with which they were running, their shins got exposed. So I looked away. And then he commanded and he said, gather all his belongings, which was his armor and so on. And said, go and give it to Amr ibn al-Wahhab and say to him, Say to him that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala married Saad to a woman who is much, much more beautiful than your daughter. My brothers and sisters, as I told you, today is storytelling day. The purpose of the stories is not entertainment. The purpose of the stories is reflection. It's for us to think about our own lives and say, do I really believe Allah? Do I really believe the promise of Allah? Because if I believe the promise of Allah, then I have to prove that belief with investing in that which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala promised. With changing my life and bringing my life in line with what will give me a reward in the akhirah. It's a question that I ask myself and it's a question that I ask you to ask yourself. And it's a question that I suggest to you and I 
remind you and myself that we have to answer this question and we have to be convinced by this question. Because if we don't answer this question, then our lives will continue to be led in the way they are currently being led and then may Allah protect us all from that, we will face the pain of regret. And as I told you, that pain is the worst of all pains. وصلى الله على نبي الكريم وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين برحمتك يا رحمة الرحيمين.